Uh, thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I did a study this past summer uh, as part of an internship at Goddard uh, on the launch of the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So I'm just going to talk about uh, several atmospheric phenomena that occurred during that launch. Okay, the Solar Dynamics Observatory was launched on February 11th, and about 76 seconds into uh, the liftoff, uh, I mean after liftoff, the Atlas V rocket uh, carrying the SDO penetrated a, a cloud deck. Uh, several inadvertent atmospheric phenomena, including the destruction of, the, of a sundog, were observed and studied. For those of you who haven't seen the YouTube video, I encourage you to type in, uh, you go to YouTube and type in the search engine, uh, SDO destroys the sundog, it's a pretty neat video. But uh, here are some, ca uh, some pictures that I captured from the video that will uh, portray what happened. Uh, the left picture shows the uh, rainbow feature is what is the sundog and it shows the cloud deck is uh, cirrostratus and on the right you can see waves that were generated and you can still see a little bit of the sun dog uh, and uh, I think you can see a little bit of red and, and yellow still present at, at right at the right of the rocket. Here's a close up of the waves you can really see the contrast uh, between the, the lighter regions and darker regions which I'll talk about later and you can also see uh, at the top of the rocket is a white collar. I'll talk about that also. So the phenomena that were observed, uh, there's two categories. There's stuff that we understand uh, very well and stuff that we don't understand very well. And uh, the one phenomena is still kind of a mystery, which I'll also talk about. Uh, the, under the well understood, uh, we observed a, what is called a crepuscular ray, a Pranthal Glauert collar, and a sun dog. And you can see the crepuscular ray is the leftmost photo, and the Prantle Glauert collar is the white collar at the top of the rocket, uh, second photo from the left, and the sun dog is the extreme right photo. Uh, the stuff that we don't understand as well uh, is pretty much the waves, and we had two questions about the waves. What type of waves were these, and how were they made visible in this cloud layer? So first I'll talk about the well understood and outline some of the, the features. Uh, the ray is created because uh, particles in the atmosphere scatter light. And when there's an obstruction to those particles uh, or a shadow, uh, the crepuscular ray is created. So you can see uh, the crepuscular ray that was created right here by the STO rocket. And you can also see another example of crepuscular rays that are caused by mountain peaks on the horizon as the sun is setting here. And basically, they're just shadows that obstruct a volume of either particles or, in this instance, ice crystals from scattering light to your eye. Now, the crepuscular ray was very important in this study because it told us the cloud layer height and depth. And here you can see a sounding that was taken uh, at 7 a.m. on February 11th. And you can see there's two possible cloud layers here. And the question we had initially was, OK, well, what cloud layer did this rocket go through? And through using several different views and videos from the launch pad, we timed when this crepuscular ray appeared and disappeared. The appearance of the ray uh, showed the approximate location of the cloud base and the disappearance of the ray, the approximate location of the cloud top. So you can see here in the bottom right graph, I, I plotted right here the cloud base and height. And you can see that corresponds relatively well with the cloud layer, that, the possible cloud layer that is shown in the sounding at around eight kilometers. Okay, the Prantzl-Glauert collar. Uh, this is a common feature seen during rocket launches. You can see the Ares rocket is right here with a, with a Prantzl-Glauert collar. And it's just an uh, effect of compressibility of the atmosphere. Uh, Bernoulli's equation shows that uh, supersonic flow will develop around a rocket body even if the rocket itself is not sonic or supersonic. As the flow of the atmosphere goes past the obstruction, in order to get around it, it must go from subsonic to supersonic, and then it'll transition back to uh, subsonic. And that transition boundary right here is called the shock front. And the low pressure region is located where the flow goes supersonic. And you can see here, homogeneous nucleation occurs, and you'll get the development of the prantzl collar. Now, what the prantzl collar told us was that the rocket was transonic during uh, the penetration of the cloud layer. 
And we also observed that the collar disappeared outside of the cloud layer, and this is a good indication of when it went supersonic. The transonic phase occurs within the Mach range of 0.8 to, point, uh, to uh, 1.2. Okay, the sun dog is relatively simple also to explain. Uh, you need a layer of falling ice crystals to create it. In our case, the crystals were most likely hex hexagonal plates. The falling ice crystals, after some time, uh, develop a horizontal orientation, and they refract light 22 degrees from the sun. And you can see here the left sun dog, uh, if you remember the photo of the, of the sun dog generated, uh, that was present during the uh, launch, uh, we were seeing the left sun dog, or left parhelion. Here's a picture of several hexagonal ice plates that would uh, be a good representation of what was uh, occurring uh, in that cloud layer. And here's a, a good picture of a circumzenith arc, which is just another part of the uh, crystal's refraction. And uh, th this is, there, there's a greater volume of ice crystals here to generate a, a better uh, display, whereas uh, during the launch that we only saw one sun dog because there weren't as many uh, ice crystals in the area or they were in dispersive volumes. So now the mystery. Well, we don't know the actual velocity of the waves. We uh, came up with a theoretical velocity which just used the, uh, a certain distance that we assumed uh, between the sun dog and the rocket and I'll talk about that later. We considered three wave types primarily. We considered shock waves that were generated by the flow around the rocket body. We uh, considered gravity waves, which would have been generated by the rocket body or by plume expansion. And we also considered Mach waves, which are generated by the exhaust flow. The major problem is that since we don't know the actual velocity, we, we kind of have to have a range of what the possible velocities are and that affects classifying the type of waves. But what we did was we looked at the line of sight of the sun dog. You can see here. This is the visitor's area where that photo was taken or where that uh, screenshot was ta uh, taken from. And you can see this is the line of sight of where the, the possible volumes of these ice crystals were that were creating the sun dog. And as you can see, from circle to circle, your velocity is going to change. We only know the time that it took the waves to get to the sun dog or the group velocity which was about two seconds. And the distance between them, if you, uh, the, the perceptive distance, which is this red line here, was about 300 meters. Although it could have been uh, much greater if you move along the line of sight. So we can use this theoretical velocity, which is between 150 and 200 meters per second, to uh, compare uh, against the calculated velocities for the wave types we considered. So the first type that we considered, uh, the shock waves generated by the rocket body, they would be generated by the shock fronts that I just talked about, located along the uh, SDO payload. Uh, these waves do fall within the possible velocity range uh, assigned by the observations, which uh, the reason is because the acoustic velocity at that altitude is around 350 meters per se I mean 315 meters per second. And uh, many people said that certain features on the rocket would develop uh, a certain number of shock fronts. And these multiple shock fronts along the rocket uh, cannot account for the total number of waves seen. As you can see at right, there are many, many waves. So that, that's, that's not really a good explanation for, for the waves we saw. And if they were generated by a single shock wave or sonic boom, just as the rocket went uh, sonic and supersonic, uh, it's going to be hard to explain the periodic structure or the, or the number of waves also because you would have a single boundary that is propagating out. As for the gravity waves, uh, what I did was I went through and calculated the internal gravity wave group velocity. Since the theoretical velocity is the group velocity, I timed how long it took the group of waves to get to the sun dog. So here you can see the orientation of the group velocity relative to the uh, phase velocity in this diagram here. And I used the pitch angle of the rocket to derive the X component of the group velocity. For 5 to 20 meter wave wavelengths, uh, I calculated a group velocity that would be very small, uh, on the order of 0.002 to 0.005 meters per second. 
and you would add this or subtract this to the uh, to the uh, flow of wind in the area, which was about 51 meters per second. And if you if we go back, you can see that if the volume of ice crystals was along this direction, the 51 meters per second wind was primarily westerly wind, and that would actually carry carry the waves away from the sun dog rather than get them to the sun dog uh, if, if the waves were traveling to that volume. So one, these waves, uh, these gravity waves are very small for small wavelengths and uh, they might have even have been taken over by the wind if they were gravity waves. So our best candidate here, uh, Mach waves, are generated by uh, the eddies that develop on the boundary of the exhaust flow so you have a lot of speed shear along this boundary and you'll have eddies develop and these eddies will generate these Mach waves. And here you can see there are many different, I mean many uh, waves that are being generated which can help explain the number of waves that we see in the video. And these Mach waves are, uh, have been found to create 100 to 1 -fifth atmospheric pressure increases along the wavefront which could uh, contribute to the visual effects we see, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and they would travel with the acoustic velocity also, 315 meters per second, which is also within the possible range. The possible range of velocities uh, for these waves is 150 meters per second and up. Unfortunately, I couldn't put a, an upper boundary uh, on, that, on that range. And this diagram shows that it's critical that uh, this exhaust flow is supersonic relative to the ambient air flow from the movement of the rocket. You can see the equation representing that. So the visibility of the waves. We considered three ways that these waves are, uh, could have been made visible. The first and uh, most popular theory that was out there was that these ice crystals uh, rapidly sublimated or deposited within these wave fronts due to uh, compressional effects. So when, when you have acoustic waves, you're going to have compression and expansion regions. And within the compression region, you're going to get a temperature increase. And people say that, well, if that temperature, in, temperature increase occurred, then you will have a subsequent uh, increase in temperature, I mean increase in uh, temperature that will sublimate the ice crystals. And then you'll get the cooling, which will make the ice crystal grow. And uh, then we also considered rapid changes in index of refraction. And uh, the, most, uh, the best candidate here would be ice crystal density or orientation changes, which after looking at all the possibilities, we found to be the most promising. Um, this graph represents uh, ice crystal growth rates. Um, you can see here that if we are considering a region of compression and there is an instantaneous increase of 25 degrees Celsius, then it would take this ice crystal about two seconds to get down to a considerable mass that you would see the contrast that, that we saw in the video. So the two main points here, since I'm kind of running low on time, is there's not enough time for these ice crystals to rapidly sublimate and deposit. And uh, if it was a gravity wave, then you would need a 2.5 kilometer amplitude to, to get enough of an increase. And if you have an increase of only about 13, degree, uh, 13 degrees Celsius, then you're actually putting the ice crystals in a more favorable environment to grow rather than sublimate. So we kind of threw that theory out. Uh, so we looked at the changes in index of refraction. Here you can see an example of light coming from two different sources, the sky and the water. And it's refracted because of the temperature changes. And here the contrast in the waves um, would be caused by the, the temperature increases and decreases along the wave fronts and you would have light, uh, light coming from different sources. But this would require a, a pretty large amplitude of compressional waves. And the waves appear to be confined to the cloud layer, which challenges the, this theory of refraction and supports the idea that the ice crystals uh, are acting as the medium for us to view these waves. So the most favorable candidate here, the ice crystal density changes or orientation changes. If you imagine that each one of these black dots is an ice crystal, you can see that higher density of ice crystals will have a higher amount of scattering of light to your eye. So this will be the light region that we see in the video and this will be the dark region. And you'll get this through compressional waves. 
So conclusions, out of the wave types considered, the, walk, the uh, mock waves seem the most promising. And the sun dog uh, was temporarily destroyed by turbulence and the subsequent uh, disruption of the ice crystal's horizontal orientations. Also, the waves were most likely visible uh, due to a change in the density and orientation of the ice crystals themselves. Any questions? Okay.